Uh, so let us begin. Uh, today we will discuss uh, the so-called uh, dimensionality reduction algorithms. Um, previously we discussed um, different ways to analyze data and uh, we discussed uh, that uh, for example, if you have two numeric variables, uh, then you can um, analyze the relation between these variables using correlations, regressions, and so on. And you can also visualize uh, this relation uh, using uh, using uh, scatter plots like this. Uh, and actually, when you look at this picture, you have uh, some knowledge about uh, about this uh, this relation. Uh, just a second, I will answer to message from Gadir. Um, sorry, just a second. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so uh, if we have just two variables, it is easy to study to study their relationships. Uh, but mm, sorry, just a second, because uh, Gazir cannot uh, join us. She says that this meeting ID is not valid. Um, do, do, do. It's strange. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so we can continue. Okay, so uh, if we have uh, if you have just two variables, everything is rather good. We can analyze this data, but uh, sometimes uh, we have uh, data with 
a lot of variables. Um, for example, uh, it is possible to consider uh, some objects like texts uh, that are very high dimensional by their nature. Uh, for example, if um, assume uh, that you are trying to solve the following problem, you are trying to uh, uh, you are trying to test: uh, Is it true that uh, two texts uh, belong to the same author or to different authors? Uh, or uh, you have several texts and you have to attribute them to uh, the corresponding authors. Or you have uh, a lot of texts and you want to cluster these texts by their authors. And uh, you don't know in advance, um, for example, authors of these texts. Uh, and uh, in this case, you can try to use the statistical tools uh, to solve this problem, uh, but uh, in this case, to, to do it, you have to transform text uh, to some uh, number of values. Um, how to transform text to, to numbers? Uh, what, what numeric feature of text uh, can, you, can you imagine? Anybody? Maybe the amount of uh, the same words or something like this. Uh, amount, uh, amount of the same words. Um, okay, uh, so uh, we can uh, we can transform text to some kind of vectors. Uh, we can uh, so. We have text and we can uh, consider different numeric features that uh, we can extract from this text. Uh, for example, a uh, number of repeating words. Uh, yes. Uh, some information statistics on the parts of speech. Uh, for example, how often in this text some uh, part of speech are used, and we can provide uh, different uh, different numeric columns for each uh, for each uh, part of speech. So, for example, um, uh, how often. Uh, or maybe we can uh, we can work with uh, rare words that are very specific to uh, uh, to the author, not to everybody. Mm, yes, but first of all, we have to find these rare words, and this is uh, another problem. Um, but yes, it is also possible approach. Uh, we also can go with some. Um, very easy to count uh, variables such as length of uh, sentences or number yeah. of words per sentences or number of syllables per sentences all these kind of features for um, text difficulty measurement mm -hmm. yeah great uh, there are uh, actually you see that uh, that there are a lot of uh, a lot of options a lot of numeric values that are associated with with a particular text and now assume that we have a collection of texts. Uh, we have like text one, uh, text two, and so on. And uh, we we can uh, convert each text uh, to the corresponding set of features like we discussed previously. Uh, so we will get uh, a lot of numeric values. Uh, and uh, so we have a kind of from fr from a collection of texts, uh, we have uh, a kind of very wide table with a lot of columns, uh, meaning that we have a lot of variables to consider. Uh, 
something like this. Uh, and uh, now um, the problem is that uh, we have too much data in a sense. Uh, actually, you can uh, you can use some fancy machine learning techniques uh, like uh, word to vex uh, uh, doc to vex uh, like BERT and so on. But I just uh, I just don't want to <clears throat> go deeply into this deep learning magic, uh, just to discuss some simple things. But uh, actually, uh, uh, methods that uh, we will discuss today can be applied to any kind of multidimensional data. Uh, so, for for example, if you have a neural network uh, that uh, produces some multidimensional output, or you want to study some multidimensional intermediate state uh, of this uh, of this neural network, you can also try to use uh, some methods of dimensionality reduction that we uh, will uh, discuss now. Uh, so, uh, our idea is the following: we have too many columns, too many variables, or mathematically speaking. Uh, our data lives in some high dimensional space. And uh, we want to apply some simple techniques like, like this scatter plot visualization uh, to this data. Uh, of course, it is possible to consider uh, every pairs uh, of uh, our uh, variables and con consider scatter plot uh, this pairwise. And we discussed that there is a special function in R that do, do it just automatically. Uh, but this, uh, this function only catches um, pairwise relations. But uh, probably there are more comple complex relations in your data that you also want to, to catch in your visualizations. Uh, then the idea is uh, to reduce uh, data data dimensionality in some way. Uh, so to increase a uh, number of variables uh, without losing of much of the data, without losing of much of the information that is contained in, in data. Um, let us discuss how to do it uh, using, uh, using rather artificial example. Uh, not not actually very artificial, but very very simple. So, uh, but uh, then uh, we will discuss how to extend it to more complex thing. Uh, let us assume that we want to reduce dimensionality from dimension two to dimension one. So uh, assume that uh, we have two variables. Uh, so this is dimensionality. Dimensionality reduction uh, in so uh, in the original problem we want to reduce the dimension of our multidimensional text space uh, to like two dimensional and after we do it uh, we can uh, for example we can plot scatter plots in this reduced uh, space and we can uh, plot some picture where every dot is a text and then we can for example group this text uh, somehow or we can see the relations between variables and so on so uh, this is uh, this is a good uh, if we are able to reduce this dimensionality in a good way it is not uh, universally possible uh, but sometimes it is possible uh, so, uh, let us consider an example. Uh, assume that we have uh, some information about uh, different students. And uh, we have, uh, for example, two, uh, two grades uh, for each student. For example, uh, mathematics and language. And we have uh, data points like this. Uh, 
Um, let me put some numbers here, like this is 10, uh, 20, 30, 50, and something like this here. So uh, we have uh, this kind of data uh, and our initial uh, space of uh, our grades is two-dimensional. Uh, we have two, two values for each student. And now assume that uh, I want to reduce the dimension of my space just to one. So uh, you can think that, uh, for example, you have to uh, give uh, all students some kind of certificate but uh, due to some uh, regulation, you have to include only one number in this certificate. Uh, and uh, you have to use this one number uh, to represent uh, the most of information about uh, the performance of the student. Uh, so you want to create a new numeric value from uh, mathematics score and language score of this student in such a way that uh, this new numeric value carries uh, the maximum of information about uh, this uh, student's uh, performance. So this is our problem. Uh, make a new variable. Uh, out of math and blank uh, such that new variable uh, contains most of information. about students' performance. So this is, this is our problem. Uh, let us first consider some simple, uh, simple ways to do it. Uh, for example, uh, we see from this picture that uh, there is uh, some correlation between math and language. So if we see student with a uh, large uh, grade math, uh, we understand that uh, the student's grade uh, on language is also rather high. Oops, here should be 40. Uh, and uh, vice versa. If we see that uh, language is large, then we see that math should be also, uh, also large. Uh, so uh, probably we can just uh, use just one of these grades, uh, for example, math, uh, to, to include into our certificate. Uh, we can try uh, just to use math. Uh, of course, in this case, we lose some information. Uh, what do I mean? Uh, if I know that a particular student uh, grade uh, for math uh, is uh, 20, uh, then I see from this graph that uh, their grade uh, for language can be uh, anything between uh, like between 10 and uh, 30, anywhere here on this Uh, on this uh, segment. And uh, the length of this segment represents uh, the uncertainty uh, about uh, the language grade uh, that I have. Um, so uh, if I just report math, uh, then uh, I have some uh, I have some I have some information about the language. Uh, but I also have some uncertainty about uh, uh, about this language grade. 
Uh, so, uh, I want to minimize, in a sense, this uncertainty. Uh, if I use math, uh, then uh, for each value of math, uh, we can estimate uh, value of grade. Uh, value of long, um, but there is some uncertainty. Uh, and uh, okay, probably we want to to make this uncertainty uh, slow, uh, smaller. And um, are there any ideas how to do it? what to include in our certificate instead of instead of math any ideas this can be a sum of uh, grade for language and grade for math divided by the average or by two uh, yes uh, yes uh, actually uh, actually, we can uh, we can report not uh, not just a, a math language, but an average between math and language. And this is actually uh, what is usually done if you have if you have uh, some diploma uh, from a university. Then, uh, when you, for, for example, apply to PhD school, uh, they uh, look. Uh, of course, they look at specific. Uh, uh, grades, but also they look at uh, GPA. Uh, uh, that is just an average of all grades that you have in your uh, in your diploma. So, uh, but the problem may be that uh, we must have uh, the equal weight of uh, grade for language and grade for math because if uh, the if language is our main course and math is something like additional they can have uh, just different weight uh, for the grades that goes to certificate well uh, yeah uh, it, it is possible it is possible that we have uh, different um, probably we have some additional information about the importance of our variables to uh, to evaluation of student uh, but now we assume that we don't have any additional information that for example we are thinking about just uh, just uh, an uh, elementary school or uh, something like this where there there is no uh, any kind of specialization and so we just we just assume that uh, initially all grades are equally good uh, for us so uh, let us uh, uh, let us analyze how our new variable uh, that is just an average of math and language uh, will work actually to report average is the same as to report sum uh, so let us just report sum because uh, one uh, can be recalculated uh, into uh, another or just by dividing or multiplication by two uh, this is uh, this is trivial operation uh, so let us use uh, cumulative score as our new variable uh, which will be just math plus uh, lang. Um, let me let me redraw the same picture. Um, so I have some points here. And uh, now let us consider a new variable, uh, which is just uh, math plus long. Uh, again, we have some numbers here. Oops. Uh, 10, 
Uh, okay. Um, uh, assume that uh, I uh, see a student uh, and um, assume that I know uh, their value of this our new certificate uh, certificate score. Um, consider the student with new var. Uh, for example, equals to um, 50. Uh, what can I say about this student? Uh, where uh, this student can be located on this picture? Which values of uh, math and length are compatible with uh, this uh, condition that uh, our new variable, which is just there, sum uh, equals to uh, fifty. Well, if we if uh, fifty is the maximum value of uh, our variables, then it should be in the right upper corner. No, it is not. Uh, it, it it is not just maximum. It, it, it is just just a sum. Just sum. Then uh, it can be actually somewhere because uh, if it's not the maximum. It can happen that uh, the value of lang is uh, small and the value of uh, math is big, and then we just yes. uh, oh we don't divide it, right? No, uh, yeah, we, we, yes, we don't divide it. Just just math plus lang. Yeah, but but still, it can happen. Uh, it can happen like uh, the value of one variable is big and the value of another variable is small, so it can be somewhere, and they can yeah. be vice versa, or they can be equal. So we still don't know where. Yes, we don't know exactly. Uh, we uh, we don't know exactly, but this is fine. Uh, actually, uh, when we discussed uh, this uh, thing uh, again here, we also didn't know exactly where where we are on this picture. If we know just math, uh, we had uh, a line, and we understand that uh, our grades are uh, along this line. If we know math, and we don't know language, then this is just a vertical line. Uh, but uh, what about this new situation? Now we know this sum of math and length. Uh, and again, I want to plot all possible points that uh, uh, for which uh, this condition, condition that math plus length uh, equal to some predefined value like this 50 uh, is uh, satisfied. Uh, what is uh, the corresponding line? Okay, uh, just to make things more familiar, let me denote, uh, let me denote. Um, well, it would uh, be like hyperbola, or how it is called in English, oh, uh, but, but positive. Uh, hyperbola is too, too complicated for this simple example. Uh, let, me, uh, let me denote math by x and lang by y. And let me consider equation x plus y equals 50. And to make things uh, even more familiar, let me uh, let Would me the line. Just yes, the line. Which line? Uh, from uh, from the left corner up to the right corner. Uh, yes, and what is the corner uh, here? Uh, where we are here. Downside. Uh, you can just tell me a number. Uh, from zero and uh, yeah. To, yeah, from here and up to the right corner. Yeah, like this. Uh, but here are the values of two variables, math and lang, are zero. Both of must them. be from 50 to 50. Mm -hmm. Yes. So this point does not belong to our condition because here are both x and y are zero. It is possible that two words, math and lang, can be zero. Yes, but uh, I ask about uh, about those uh, those uh, pairs of x oh, okay. and y uh, that satisfy this condition. I so, uh, I so see, it I must see. be it must be a line from the left upper corner to the right down corner from yeah. fifty to fifty. Yeah, exactly. So my question is, uh, I I see a student, I see a student uh, for which the sum of math and lang uh, scores. 
uh, is equal to 50. I ask, uh, what, uh, vary, what values of mouth and lung uh, can uh, be correct for the students? What, what are the possible pairs? Uh, mouth and lung. And we understand that uh, if we see that uh, the sum is 50, uh, then it is possible, for example, that uh, their lung variable is very large, it is 50, but math is uh, very small, it is zero. So we can be here. But also it is possible that we have an opposite uh, situation when we are here. And also all intermediate situations are also possible. So actually there is a straight line just between these two points. And uh, you can see that uh, it is indeed a straight line in the following way. I can just, um, I can just move uh, this X variable to the right hand side. Uh, and then I get this equation. And uh, you probably, you probably uh, are familiar with these equations because it is uh, actually the same equation that we used for linear regression. And we see that uh, this is a line with intercept uh, 50. So it should start at 50 here. And uh, its slope is negative one, so it should go downwards. So it is a straight line. Okay. Is it clear how this thing worked? Okay, I think it is clear. Uh, so, uh, actually, uh, actually, why, uh, why uh, I want to draw this line? Uh, this is because I, I want to, to estimate the level of uh, uncertainty that I have now. Uh, actually, again, uh, I believe that all my students uh, lie uh, somewhere inside of this ellipse. Uh, and it means that if I know uh, this information, uh, this information about the sum of two variables, then I, under I understand that theoretically uh, it is possible for my student to be uh, somewhere uh, at this green line. But uh, we know that uh, there are no students here and here due to this this shape due to this correlation. Uh, so we see that uh, there is a possibility uh, that our student is somewhere here. And uh, the length of this segment measures our uncertainty about, uh, about grades of the student. Now we have some uncertainty about both, uh, about both uh, mathematical grade and language grade, but the overall length of uh, the overall, uh, overall level of our uncertainty uh, is uh, is determined by uh, the length of this uh, of this segment. At least we can we can use it as a kind of measure of our uncertainty. Uh, now uh, let us uh, compare. Uh, this uncertainty with uh, the uncertainty that uh, we get on the previous picture. So we have to compare, we have to compare this um, segment with this segment. Uh, which one is smaller? I think we need to count. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I just uh, this is just a question about intuition. So, if you have uh, if you have like an ellipsoid, like this, assume that this is a more or less perfect ellipsoid, and you have to compare, you have to compare um, this segment. Uh, with uh, this segment. Well, the, the second one is smaller. Uh, yeah. Yes, this okay. is, uh, this is smaller. Hmm? Okay, uh, I have a real world uh, example. 
if you have uh, if you have a bread, and uh, it is possible that uh, you want to get uh, small pieces of this bread, or you you want uh, large pieces of this bread. Uh, if I want uh, small pieces, uh, then uh, I will cut my bread in this way. But uh, if I want uh, large pieces, then uh, I will cut it uh, something like this, diagonally, right? Uh, so uh, it is our intuition uh, that uh, this, uh, these parts are smaller than these parts. If you don't believe me, you can try to get uh, some bread and cut it in two different ways. Okay. Uh, so uh, let us return to to this picture. Uh, in fact, we see that uh, are these uh, this new uh, this new variable that is just a sum of math and lang uh, is uh, a good choice if we want to reduce this uncertainty if we measure this uncertainty as a length of this of this segment a, another name for this length uh, is just a variance of uh, the corresponding variable so uh, if we have math fixed we see that uh, we have large variance of the of this variable but uh, if we uh, fix this uh, thing uh, if we fix this sum, then variance uh, along this uh, along this straight line will be will be less. So it is preferred for us to use uh, this variable instead of just reporting math or instead of just reporting log, because it minimizes the corresponding variance of. Uh, minimizes our uncertainty about about our values uh, is it idea clear are there any additional comments needed i think it's clear mm -hmm. okay uh now uh let me draw. Uh, let me draw several uh, lines uh, that corresponds to this kind of condition, um, but uh, I will change uh, this number. Uh, so um, let me again redraw this picture. I have math and lang here, and. Uh, now, uh, let me denote uh, my uh, new variable as uh, PC one. I will explain. Uh, I will explain this um, uh, this notation later. So let me assume that PC one is just math uh, plus lang. And uh, in this case, uh, if I want to draw. Uh, um, if I want to draw sets uh, like PC1 equals to some constant, uh, like uh, not 50, but for example, 40, uh, what, is, uh, what is the line that corresponds to this condition? So uh, we had a line that corresponds to 50. That would be the line from 40 to 40, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have we have several lines like this line, and this corresponds to PC1 equals to 50, and this line corresponds to PC1 equals to 40. 
and so on. So we have this series of lines. Okay. Uh, now uh, let me. Uh, I, I, I I want to introduce a new coordinate system. I want to uh, I want to introduce a second uh, a second new variable. Now uh, PC one is my first new variable, and I want to introduce a second new variable. Uh, and um, we see that uh, our PC one uh, is changed uh, along this direction. Uh, so uh, let me consider a new variable that will change uh, along uh, this direction. Uh, how to how to create this new variable? So uh, I want I want this axis to be PC one, and uh, I want to consider just orthogonal line uh, that is called PC2 and um, so uh, okay uh, let me just uh, let me just uh, say that PC2 equals to um, minus math plus lang Uh, what can I say about values uh, when PC2 uh, equals to something predefined? For example, what can you say about uh, values where PC2 equals to zero? Uh, it means that math and lang are equal to each other. Yes, uh, math and lang are, are equal. So I have a question. Uh, does that mean if the bread is different shaped or say rotated, we may want to use another uh, dimensionality reduction technique um yeah well uh, in a sense yes uh, in a sense yes uh, actually we assume uh, when we introduce this technique we assume something about our data uh, but these assumptions uh, these assumptions more or less uh, that um, our uh, that our data in two-dimensional case, uh, it's more or less uh, the same as uh, to say that uh, our variables are correlated with each other. So we have some straight line uh, such that our points uh, lie near this straight line. Uh, this straight line. If uh, this condition is satisfied, uh, then uh, we can uh, apply this uh, technique that is called principal component analysis. If we have something more complicated, uh, like something like this. Uh, then uh, principal component analysis uh, will not be very useful uh, because uh, because there is nonlinear dependency and principal component analysis is linear method. It is uh, it, it it uses some assumptions about linear relation between variables. Uh, so, uh, what to do with these nonlinear nonlinear uh, things? Uh, we will also uh, discuss. We can use different techniques, like MDS uh, or uh, or some manifold learning or TSME. Um, there are various others. Okay. So, uh, if uh, let us return here. Uh, if uh, we see that PC2 equals to zero, uh, then uh, we are on on this line. It means just uh, that math and grade are the same. Uh, this is PC2 equals to zero. Okay, what if what if PC2 equals to ten? What is uh, how how this line looks? What well, would be the parallel parallel low line to the PC one? But um, it will it will um, be just upper 
uh, by PC. yes uh, yes shifted shifted to the bottom because yep. if uh, if PC two equals to ten it means that uh, lung is larger than mouth because lung uh, is positive here and mouth is negative uh, so uh, so we have this um, we have this relation and. Uh, now uh, assume that I know both. Uh, uh, of course, uh, of course, I can I can continue. Uh, for example, this is uh, PC two equals to twenty, and so on. Uh, now, if I know both variables, PC one and PC two, then uh, I can uh, I can recover unique point that satisfy uh, that has that has this value of PC1 and PC2. Actually, we can do it geometrically because if we know PC1, uh, then we know uh, this kind of line. And if we know PC2, we know this kind of line. And we have a unique intersection between these two lines. Let me check that it is clear. For example, uh, let me assume that uh, PC1 uh, equals to 40 and PC2 equals to, uh, let me use some point, 10. Uh, what can you say, uh, what can you say about math and lung? Math is bigger than lung. Yes. And um, it should be something like math is around 30. Yes. And long is about. Uh, mm. Yes, but uh, if PC2 equals to 10, then the difference between math and long should be 10. Yeah. And so long should be 20. Uh, uh, no, if PC, if PC2 equals to 10, then it means that uh, lung is larger than mouth. Lung have to be larger than mouth. Uh, so we basically, okay, let us look at the picture. If, uh, if PC1 equals to 40, then it means that we are somewhere on this line. And if uh, PC1 equals to 10, then it means that we are somewhere on this line. So uh, PC, this is uh, this is the first line, and uh, this is the second line, and we see the intersection, which is here. This point, and uh, this point uh, is. I think it means that math is 15 and lung is uh, 25. We see that this point satisfies both conditions. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, uh, Lisa, I just, uh, I just want to say that the pair of uh, PC1 and PC2 uh, can be also considered as a kind of coordinates in the initial space. So if I know, uh, if I know PC1 and PC2, I can recover math and ink. Uh, so uh, I just want to say that I introduced, uh, by, uh, by introducing this PC1 and PC2, I introduce a new coordinate system of the original space. And this is this is my point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so we see actually that uh, what I did is uh, a, a very simple thing. Uh, I just say that uh, okay, I I had original coordinate system when uh, there was math and lung. And uh, I have a new coordinate system. Uh, 
when I have PC1 and PC2. Uh, and uh, now uh, assume that I have a point. Okay, uh, let us uh, let us consider this point that was discussed here. Uh, so this is. Um, this point uh, that has 15 here and 25 here. Uh, and uh, the same point, um, we can find a new coordinate of the same point. Uh, to do so, we just have uh, to think uh, that, okay, we can just rotate uh, this picture uh, and uh, think that uh, this, this uh, uh, line is a new horizontal coordinate and this line is a new vertical coordinate. So, well, in fact, we just change the basis. Exactly, exactly. Yes, in terms of linear algebra, it is just a basis change. Uh, so we have these new coordinates and here we have value 40 and here we have value 10. Okay. This is actually just a rotation of this basis. We also rescaled it a little bit, but uh, in fact, later we will not rescale it. Uh, so, uh, I want to say that my new basis, my new coordinate system, PC1 and PC2, is uh, in a sense better than the previous coordinate system. Uh, why, uh, why, I say uh, why I say it? Let me, let me redraw this picture in, in new coordinates. Uh, okay, let us... So my original picture was like this. And uh, now I uh, redraw it. Just, uh, this is just a rotation. I just rotate the whole picture. And now I have some data uh, here. Something like this. Uh, what? Uh, uh, what? Uh, oh, oops, sorry. This is not PC two. Uh, this is. Uh, they are different. Uh, this is PC one, and this is PC two, and this is important. So, uh, I have uh, my new coordinates, PC one and PC two. Uh, and now uh, these co uh, these coordinates uh, are essentially different if we compare variance of uh, my variables, uh, we see that the variance of uh, PC1, so this, this variance, variance along this axis, uh, is large. And uh, variance of PC2 is rather small. Uh, in the original, uh, in the original uh, data set in, with original variables, we see that variance of both of both variables, math and long, uh, is more or less the same. So it, it it was like a symmetrical picture. We cannot prefer math over long or long over math because they have more or less uh, the same variance. And if we just uh, remove one of these uh, variables, then we lost uh, the variance that is associated with this variable. We add uh, and uncertainty. Uh, but here uh, we have clear distinction between these two new variables. We see that variance of PC1 is large and variance of PC2 is small. So if I uh, look at this picture and I have to decide uh, which variable to keep and which uh, just to remove, to throw, uh, which variable uh, will uh, will I keep? Uh, 
if I want to lose as uh, a small amount of uh, of variance as possible. Uh, in other words, uh, which uh, which variable uh, PC one or PC two? Keep uh, if uh, I want to uh, to preserve as much information as possible. Oh, we should keep PC one because we have the more variables, more more uh, different variables. Uh, as much uh, information as possible. Yes, uh, if uh, if 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 I think uh, if I think about if I think about uh, amount of information in terms of variance, then uh, I have to I have to keep uh, PC one because uh, PC one changes uh, in in large range, but PC two changes uh, on the on the in a small range. Uh, so this is this is uh, the idea. Now we have some order on our variables. Uh, actually, these uh, these variables uh, PC uh, they uh, they are I uh, denote them by PC uh, because uh, they are called principal components. Главный компонент по русски. Uh, actually, we have the same number of principal components uh, as uh, we have uh, our original variables. So in this case, we had two original variables and uh, we have two principal components. Uh, and uh, this, is, uh, this is the usual situation. Uh, but uh, for principal components, we have, we have an order. We see that principal component one it is, uh, in a sense, more principal. It is more important uh, in terms of variance than principal component two. Uh, about interpretation of PC one and PC two. Uh, well, uh, again, it depends. Uh, it depends on your problem. Uh, if you have, uh, if you have some clear interpretation. Uh, then uh, you probably uh, uh, you probably can decide that you want to get some information that is represented by PC two. Uh, it e theoretically uh, theoretically it is possible. Uh, I consider a case now when you don't have any uh, any any a priori interpretations about your about your variables. Um, so this is uh, this is this is my idea. So uh, in in other in other sense, uh, let me let me return to my original picture. I have. Uh, I have this this picture, and uh, if uh, I want to choose a new axis uh, and your and your line along which I will measure my values, uh, if I want to choose uh, my first uh, principal component, uh, then uh, I want to maximize uh, the variance along this along this direction. Uh, in this case. I will maximize uh, my variance if I choose my new axis along the long axis of this ellipsoid. In this case, ellipse. So uh, I just want to choose the direction of maximum variance. And uh, this direction will be the direction of uh, smallest variance. Uh, 
so this variance is uh, the smallest possible and this variance is largest possible. Uh, so in, uh, in other words, uh, when I want to find uh, my principal components, uh, I have to find these directions. Uh, for example, when I, I think about first principal component, I just want to find uh, this direction uh, along which uh, the variance of my points uh, is uh, the largest. Okay. For example, it is possible that uh, we have different uh, variances in the original data set. Uh, assume that, uh, for example, we have this picture. This is mouth and this is lung. And assume that we have something like this. Uh, I think that, uh, assume that I have this picture. Uh, in this case, uh, I see that uh, the variance of math variable uh, is larger than uh, the variance of lung variable. Uh, how do you think? Uh, what, uh, uh, how should we use this information when we write uh, this uh, formula for PC1? So I can uh, I can give some weight to math and lung. Uh, I can I can include some coefficients, and uh, which variable should I include with larger coefficient? How do you think? Uh, will it depend on uh, the global coefficient? I have no idea what's that for. What's English? Uh, global coefficient, uh, global coefficient is slope. Так, да, что вы хотите с углом коэффициентом? Well, uh, PC1 is just a line. So, um, we need to decide uh, the angle. Mm -hmm. so we need to, to decide on the slope, and mm -hmm. this slope uh, somehow uh, depends on uh, one of the uh, variables, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, actually, actually, we want uh, we want uh, to consider. Uh, we want to make as our new uh, as our new coordinate. Okay, let me just shift uh, this picture a little bit uh, just to, okay, let me assume that my data was like this. This is just for simplicity of our uh, calculations. Uh, so uh, we see that uh, mathematics uh, has large variance and one here has sm small variance. And uh, so uh, if we consider the line along which we have largest variance, it will be close uh, closer to math, right? Then to 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 lung. Yes. So, so this... math would have uh, the bigger coefficient. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Uh, so uh, it is possible that we have something like uh, uh, like o dot eight uh, coefficient here and o dot four uh, coefficient here. 
and uh, this will be our PC1, and uh, PC2 will be orthogonal. Something like this. Okay. Uh, so, uh, if uh, the idea is that if one variable uh, has larger variance than another variable, uh, then uh, we have here uh, larger larger coefficient uh, that corresponds to larger variance. So, uh, we will say that uh, uh, math uh, has a larger impact uh, on PC1 or that the corresponding weight uh, is larger. Um, this is uh, this is actually this is actually rather intuitive because if we see that math uh, has larger variance, then probably we want to include uh, this math with larger weight to this PC1. Okay, uh, now uh, let me show you some uh, computer-generated pictures. If I find them, just a second. You can think uh, what to do if uh, you have not, uh, not uh, two variables, but more than two variables. If you have, for example, three variables, uh, what is what will we have in, in this case? Well, probably we will have to do pretty much the same. We will need to find the new basis mm -hmm. uh, that is. Uh, connected somehow with the variance of uh, mm -hmm. these three variables we have. Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly, and let me show how, uh, how it looks in three-dimensional. So I need to share now different screen probably. So, uh, assume now that we have a three-dimensional space and we have some points in this uh, three-dimensional space. Uh, do, you see, uh, do you see my screen now with three-dimensional picture? Yeah, everything is mm -hmm. pretty good. Actually, I can just send you a link so you will be able to play uh, with uh, these pictures by yourself. Actually, I had a... Sorry? Uh, and um, now uh, let us think uh, how should we choose, for example, uh, the first principal component axis. In which direction should we uh, should we uh, put this this new uh, this new axis? Uh, again, we can think uh, that uh, there is a kind of ellipsoid. And most of our data are contained in this ellipsoid. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, if we consider this ellipsoid, there is a long axis of this ellipsoid, like this one. And uh, we have to choose uh, this axis as our first, our first uh, principal component, like here. And uh, then we have to choose uh, the second principal component. How to do it? Actually, you see that, uh, okay, we, we choose the first component, but then we have uh, the rest two, two dimensions. And in these two dimensions, different directions are 
in a sense different. They also have different variants. Actually, we can just look uh, look uh, like this uh, when uh, our first uh, first uh, principal component is uh, just uh, perpendicular to our uh, plane of view. Uh, and then uh, here you see that uh, there is direction with larger variants like this one. And there is direction with smaller variants like this one. And uh, actually, you have to use this direction as the second principal component because it catches uh, the uh, the most of uh, variants that is not catched by the first uh, the first principal component. So uh, we basically say that uh, we uh, that. In other words, we can say that uh, the most of our points uh, lie uh, near some plane in the three-dimensional space. And we want to recover this plane. And uh, to do so, we choose uh, our first uh, principal component. And uh, then uh, we, we look at this picture and uh, we ask, okay, uh, where this, uh, assume that we have a plane that uh, pass through the first uh, principal component. Uh, what, uh, uh, how should it uh, pass uh, in the in the rest of uh, direction? Uh, it should pass uh, in such a way that uh, that uh, in this picture we see this plane uh, like like this. And uh, actually, uh, this is uh, this is what we really need. This is uh, this is our second principal component, and uh, this line, this line, and uh, the third principal component uh, is just uh, an orthogonal. It is just perpendicular to the first two principal components. Uh, this is uh, this is what we have. This is the plane, uh, and we believe that. Uh, most of our points just lie uh, on this plane or somewhere near this plane. And uh, the idea is that if we just uh, project everything on this plane, so if we just forget uh, this uh, orthogonal uh, coordinate, then we lose not so many information about our points. Uh, so so this is this is what we have. And uh, this is the graph uh, of uh, our data in uh, the coordinates PC1, PC2. So we forgot PC3 here. We just projected everything just to the plane uh, PC1, PC2. Uh, and uh, these uh, are our points. And uh, this, uh, these vectors uh, are just uh, our original coordinates. So here we see that uh, we have coordinate x uh, that uh, is associated with PC1 and PC2. And we have, for example, coordinate y, uh, which, is, which is correlated mostly with PC1, but not with uh, PC2. And just a small, a small impact on PC2 of this variable y. Uh, and uh, when you do this principal component analysis uh, in R, uh, you get uh, some uh, results uh, that is, um, actually what you, what you get, you get this, uh, this thing, which is a rotation matrix. And uh, it gives you coefficients that relate uh, your variables, uh, original variables with uh, principal components. Uh, so, for example, uh, here we see that PC1 is calculated as uh, this value multiplied by x, uh, this value multiplied by y, and plus this value multiplied by z. So this is just, just like we discussed previously. But uh, actually how it is connected with the decreasing of the dimensions of yeah. our yes. variables. Uh -huh. We okay. still have three variables. 
Uh, yes, uh, exactly. Uh, exactly. Uh, that's a good question. We still have three variables, but uh, now these variables um, uh, have different uh, different variants. Uh, we see that uh, this PC3 uh, has a smallest variance. Actually, we can we can find these variances. Uh, yes, this is uh, this is here, and you see that um, PC1. Uh, has a uh, standard deviation, which is square root of variance of four, uh, PC2 of two, and PC3 only one. Uh, in, uh, other, uh, in other terms, we see here uh, that uh, PC1 and PC2 together uh, explains 95% uh, of uh, the whole variance uh, in your data. Uh, it means that uh, if we just uh, remove PC3, if we just project everything to PC1 and PC2, uh, then uh, you will lose uh, only a small fraction of information, at least measured in terms of variance uh, of your data. So basically you say the following thing, that if you believe that your three-dimensional uh, data, data in three-dimensional space, uh, in fact, lie uh, near some two-dimensional uh, two uh, plane, then uh, to lose uh, a smallest uh, amount of information, you have to project your three-dimensional space to that plane. And principal component analysis tries to recover this plane. Uh, so uh, if we have these principal components, uh, we can uh, look at uh, this at this table, and uh, we can decide. Okay, uh, I see that uh, first two principal components uh, describe uh, a lot of information. Then uh, probably I can just remove uh, the rest components, and uh, in this way uh, to decrease the dimensionality of my of my data. Uh, this is how we can we use it. Okay. That's really cool. And uh, what would be like if we have a lot of dimensions, um, when we will try to decrease the dimensionality of uh, our uh, variables, we will lose too much information. Well, of course it is possible. Of course it is possible. This is not, uh, this is not a universal solution. Uh, this is um, actually, actually this is a little bit well, um, principal component analysis is, on one hand, it is nice. On the other hand, it is possible that, for example, uh, for your practical problem, uh, you really have a lot of information in this PC3. So uh, this interpretation of variance as a measure of uh, amount of information uh, is actually not, not universal. Uh, probably you really for some practical task you really need you really need this thing well it is possible uh, this is not uh, this is not a universal solution uh, actually uh, there are two ways uh, when this principal component analysis or other dimensionality reduction uh, reduction techniques are used uh, first uh, case is when you need to visualize your data and just look uh, look at it uh, and just try to to understand something to uh, to state some hypothesis uh, something like this and in this case of course you can lose some information using using dimensionality reduction but well you have no choice <laughs> it is not possible to visualize data in a 17 dimensional space uh, nobody can imagine this space and uh, there are no algorithms that allows us to uh, to make visualizations in this space. Uh, so you have to you have to reduce it in, in some way. Uh, sometimes uh, you can't use principal component analysis because your data is nonlinear. There is no uh, such plane, for example, uh, near which our, our points uh, are located. Uh, it is possible that you have something more complex. Well, it is possible. There are different ways to do it. Um, for example, this is T, S, and E, uh, but it is uh, it is rather okay. There are there are their own problems uh, with the, with that methods. Of course, if you have multi-dimensional data, uh, it is not um, 
uh, it is natural that uh, we don't have any universal way to compress this multidimensional data to, uh, to, 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 to smaller dimensions because, okay, it is just not possible. But if we assume something, some additional, additional assumptions, then sometimes it is possible. And in a lot of cases, it is, it is useful on practice. And uh, the second case when we can try to do it, if uh, we have some algorithm that works well with, uh, that works well with low dimensional data, for example, clustering algorithms uh, or some other, and uh, we want to apply them to multidimensional data. And then we probably can just reduce the dimension and then apply our algorithm. Sometimes it will get better result than to apply our algorithm to the original data, but sometimes not. Again, there are no universal solutions. Okay, so, so I think that uh, this is all that uh, I wanted to say about, about principal components. Uh, there is another topic uh, that, uh, that is related to uh, this uh, reduction, I, I don't know, I, I already have minus six minutes. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, oh, I uh, think we can stop for now, okay. but uh, there are some questions uh, yes. in the chat. Could you Okay, 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 yes, yes, let me, let me look. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, I answered all the questions that are in Zoom group chat. Are there any other in some other ways, no places? Can I ask a silly question? Sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, let's imagine that uh, we have uh, the same uh, idea with the grades, uh, but in three dimensions. Can we have uh, such an idea here? For example, three... Uh, uh, for example, language, math, and maybe physics, something like this. Is it possible to use a three-dimension idea here? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Exactly. Uh, actually, uh, actually, at the end of the lecture notes uh, that uh, I opened now, uh, exactly this example was considered. And I don't know. Uh, okay. Uh, I think that uh, on the practical, you will consider a different example. And okay, uh, uh, but when, yes, when, we had, mm -hmm. uh, when we had uh, two dimensions, we had PC1 as a, a sum of two variables, uh, and we had PC2 as a difference of two variables, uh, and what would be PC3 in this way? Maybe, uh, and what would be PC2 in three di dimensions because mm -hmm. uh, we have three variables. Can you explain, please? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, look, uh, look here. Uh, here we have data uh, that we probably already discussed. Uh, this is uh, HSB2 information about uh, some grades uh, of students uh, by uh, subjects science, math, read, write, and social studies. And uh, uh, I actually I, I actually like this uh, example uh, because look uh, here we applied uh, this principal component analysis to uh, all the variables that we have, and uh, we see uh, that we have uh, first principal component here, and uh, we see that uh, uh, practically all variables. Uh, are included into this uh, principal component, uh, the first principal component, with more or less uh, equal weights. So they are a little bit different, but uh, they are more or less the same. So uh, PC1 is just a kind of average of this uh, of these grades, which is quite natural. And now let us look at PC2. Uh, we can look uh, at uh, this uh, at this matrix, or we can look at uh, this picture. And uh, how can you interpret here PC two?
So we see that PC2 uh, is uh, created from these variables uh, in the following way. Uh, it is read times uh, this coefficient plus write times this coefficient and so on. Uh, so uh, we see that we have large coefficients uh, that are associated with social studies and science and also we have some uh, a bit smaller coefficient that is associated with math. So uh, what measures PC2? Uh, note that uh, there are different signs for social study and for science and math. What measures PC2? Just in, in practical terms. Any ideas how to interpret it? Well, maybe the biggest impact uh, has social studies. So the most information PC2 has about this subject. Uh, yes, uh, yes, this is, uh, this is correct. Uh, but okay, if, if, if you want to explain what measures uh, PC2 just to, to somebody who don't understand, uh, who don't understand uh, everything that we discussed. Just you show this picture and uh, you, you want to give some rough idea of what PC2 measures in this case. The degrees. Uh, Lisa, I don't understand what is degrees of 11 form. Uh, the grades, I mean. Uh, I think she means the grace of the 11 uh, form, 11. Uh, I don't know what is 11 form. Uh, 11 class, at, at ah. the last, the last one. Uh, well, uh, yeah. if you're, if you, if you're asking about the original data, I don't know. I don't know what uh, these grades mean exactly. But uh, I think it is uh, some kind of standardized test uh, in, in, in some uh, American schools. Okay, uh, I just want to say that PC2, uh, it is increased uh, if uh, some students have larger grades uh, for math and science, and it is decreased uh, if the student has larger grades for social studies. Uh, and we see this on this picture. Uh, we see here uh, this vector social studies uh, that is uh, directed into the negative direction of PC2 and uh, this science uh, that is uh, directed in the positive direction. So uh, in, in other sense, we say uh, the following. Uh, PC1 says that uh, there are students of different performance, uh, but if we fix the overall performance of a student, we can distinguish these students uh, by their, what, what property, how can we, how can we say? Uh, well, I think this is a kind of uh, division uh, uh, like more um, hard science uh, people and more social study people. So probably it is uh, somewhat related to archetypical uh, division of people uh, into categories uh, of uh, humanitarian and uh, uh, technicians, uh, but uh, uh, I'm not sure that uh, it is correct, but anyway, we see that yeah, there is uh, some uh, some um, the, there is variable that distinguish people who uh, who like uh, social studies and get better grades on social studies, and those people who like science and math. So this is this is just uh, another uh, another axis of uh, our consideration. So at least PC2 is uh, more or less interpretable in, in this case. Actually, I cannot interpret PC3 here. Uh, I, 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 I can't provide any reasonable interpretation in terms of the original problem. So uh, this is what, uh, what happens if we apply our PC1 and PC, uh, our principal component analysis to this five dimensional data. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if we 
uh, if we have this picture and if, if we have a particular uh, point on this picture, a particular student, for example, this student, we can say, okay, we see that this student uh, has uh, uh, some average overall performance, but uh, this student is really good uh, at science and at math, probably, but uh, not so good in social studies, so uh, the, the overall performance will be low. This is how can we interpret uh, this, uh, this picture. So we see that we can uh, get some information, some, some interpretation from, uh, from this picture in two-dimensional space. Okay, uh, other questions? Okay, then uh, I think that we can make a 10 minutes break now and then continue in the same, uh, in the same meeting. So, so stay tuned, we will return in 10 minutes. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much. I will stop sharing my screen.
Okay, hello everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, hello. Hello. Yeah, uh, well, um, uh, since we are doing the class uh, online today, uh, please be prepared that I can ask you to share your screens in order to see if you are uh, all right with the code. Is it okay? I have a little problem because uh, I'm I have Zoom on my phone and uh, I have uh, an open tar studio on my PC but maybe I can use my camera for it I don't know Okay Does anybody else has their uh, Zoom installed on the laptop Actually, I have the same problem because uh -huh. I have Zoom on my mobile phone and uh, I opened the lab on my PC. Yep, the same. Okay, is it Dmitry, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I have... Uh, um, zoom in on my tablet and uh... ah, okay great mm -hmm. thanks uh okay uh, so let's start with the uh, yeah today's lab on dimensionality reduction and first uh i have to say that there are a lot of packages in r to do uh such techniques as uh, principal component analysis and discriminant analysis and multi-dimensional scaling and TSME and so on so forth. So, well, I think that uh, we just look at one uh, package today, but you can also, well, <clears throat> practice with other um, packages. Uh, and if you will need to use uh, well, PCA or other kinds of uh, dimensionality re uh, reduction techniques for your uh, final projects, you can also use whatever you want. Okay, uh, first let us look at uh, the data uh, from um, Hutch and Locker and uh, co authors. Um, uh, actually, the um, Head of the lab is Jane Levine. Um, in their um, study, uh, they analyzed uh, the child's speech, uh, speech, but actually they compared um, uh, how um, people, um, both mothers and children, um, uh, use. Uh, I, I, I mean uh, how they how they talk to each other, yeah. So in this data set, uh, authors took um, forty second pairs of mothers and children, uh, and they recorded and transcribed two hours per each child per day. So this is uh, an example of the longitudinal study, when you actually record uh, people well from time to time uh, usually uh, several times per year and sometimes uh, such longitudinal studies can long as much as say four years you know, starting from the very early age of the child okay uh, but let us um, get back to this particular study so in this data set we can see uh, the number uh, of noun phrases per utterance used in mother speech and the number of noun phrases used uh, in the child speech. Yeah. Um, what do you think? What was the general, the very general um, hypothesis of this study? If we just want to compare uh, a kind of productivity of mothers and childs. Mm 
Uh, probably the hypothesis was that um, you know, the biggest is the number of noun phrases in mother's speech, the biggest is the number of noun phrases in child's speech? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, the idea was that actually uh, ch uh, children uh, talk more if their uh, mother uh, talk more to them. Uh, okay, so let us first um, uh, read the data set and just do a cutter plot uh, for uh, these kind of data. Uh, in this particular uh, uh, line of code, uh, lines of code, we can actually uh, draw the stat ellipse, which is an analog of the um, confidential interval but for the uh, two-dimensional mm, data. So actually we see uh, yeah, that there are some points outside our uh, uh, statistical ellipse, but mm -hmm. still uh, we, well, kind of see some idea that, well, the variance of both mother's uh, noun phrases and child's uh, noun phrases, just not random, yeah? Well, and let us, um, uh, move on with the PCA. Okay, uh, first um, let us um, uh, run just the um, very um, simple technique. Yeah, uh, in this code, I will run the linear model with the regression. Yeah, and just plot. Uh, this kind of regression line on my previous plot. And that is what uh, Ilya actually discussed in the beginning of his lecture. Yeah, so we can start with the just uh, regression and see what happens. And um, now we can usually uh, uh, proceed with using regression for predicting value of one variable by another variable. If I am too fast, please tell me. Well, I can slow a bit. Well, can you please describe more precisely what's going on in the very code? Okay, great. Uh, do you mean this code or the code above? Uh, this one, this one. Okay, yeah, great. Okay, so the beginning of the code is the same as above, right? And now I actually um, make um, also um, a kind of um, well, prediction, yeah, uh, using my um, well, uh, uh, using my model. Uh, GM segment is actually just for doing the uh, errors, er 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 errors. Yeah, so I can actually uh, put these two, uh, two red uh, errors here just on the plot. So you can see that X and and Y and and uh, Y and X is actually the coordinates for my error. 
And we can see here that we kind of like give them uh, uh, precisely, like uh, we just give the numbers and yeah. how do we know that we should use uh, a Y as uh, 1.8? Uh, because actually I use uh, the results of my regression. So I predicted uh, the coordinates uh, using the, my uh, regression model for this particular point. Ah, okay, I see. So it's just for, for yeah. the one point. So yeah, so these are just the uh, coordinates for, for my errors. So no magic, it's just to make, um, well, everything explicit as much as possible. Okay, and now we, uh, well, go to the PCA technique. And uh, today we will use the peer comp function uh, to produce, uh, well, our PCA uh, metrics. So this function is very simple. It is just take the data uh, data set, our data 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 frame, just as or any other kind of um, data frame or metrics, numerical metrics. Well, and um, create the PCI uh, PCA uh, object. Let us first look at the um, uh, cumulative uh, matrix. Um, uh, let us see what the uh, summary of the peer comp .df. Sorry, uh, could yeah. you please explain what does the um, center do? What kind of uh, no, I just uh, uh, just skip this for now, and I will explain it yeah, uh, a bit later. Right? Okay. So uh, first, because uh, actually the very important part of the PCA thing is to check whether the um, proportion of explained variance is high or not. Yeah. So um, we usually use just the peer, uh, run just the peer comp of some data, uh, data frame or a summary of a peer comp. And the summary uh, can show us the last line. Uh, in the last slide, it show, shows us the cumulative proportion of our data. Uh, since we have only two variables here, uh, so we can see that the first component explains uh, about 80% uh, of um, variance. Yeah. And yeah, the second component, well, it is quite natural that explain 100% uh, variance, right? So for now, we just see whether we uh, whether this kind of uh, uh, proportion is okay, yeah. Uh, and now we can look at uh, just the um, coordinates uh, in our um, uh, rotated uh, space, yeah. Uh, and let us look uh, how our um, components rotated comparing to the old axis. Yeah. So in the next um, block of code, 
we just run a peer comp diff. and can see what uh, happened with uh, uh, our variables. Yeah, so here we can see that child has uh, 0.58 uh, and um, uh, 0.80 at PC2. And let us look back uh, back to uh, go back to the uh, PCA rotation, yeah, above. Uh, and we can see that these numbers are actually the same as uh, in just the, what peer comp gives us as its main output. Uh, yeah, and actually, uh, yeah, and, and actually, yeah, you're right that the numbers are not online with uh, what we get uh, from the uh, from this uh, data. So I'm sorry. Actually, now we will we'll have to actually uh, put uh, something like. Uh, let us look. Um, the uh, rotation uh, coefficients here. Yeah, and not uh, the uh, what um, uh, actually given uh, in the text. Sorry, it's just uh, the problem of uh, that the data was were taken from some previous data set. Okay, thank you, um, Alex, for answering this question. Yeah. Okay, and now we can actually uh, use the the, uh, the new axis to plot our data. Yeah. Uh, we actually uh, have a lot of well um, packages to just plot the data, but we will use uh, auto plot from GG Fortify uh, package today. Uh, and here we can uh, do the by plot. Yeah, so we we will um, actually plot our points uh, in the new uh, PC space. Yeah, and uh, when I uh, put uh, loadings, yeah, when I get these uh, red uh, arrows. Uh, 
uh, and now we see that uh, how our axis uh, changed yeah, from the original um, space. Okay, um, and uh, I also give you some examples of other uh, functions that can uh, do PCA uh, in R. And actually, each year we see that more and more functions are provided. Well, um, uh, in my opinion, factor minor PCA function is very uh, elegant and um, has uh, some built-in um, uh, tools for visualizations. Yeah, but uh, yeah, you can use other kinds of techniques. Okay, if you... Oops. Great, so let us um, well go on with the next um, data set. And we will use the frequency word lists from Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, and um, John uh, to see uh, the um, some kind of portrait of these uh, four texts. Um, uh, it is very well known that uh, John um, uh, uh, John's Gospels is well comparatively distinct from uh, other three uh, texts. And we can look at the variance of lexicon in this data. Yeah. Uh, in this data set, uh, actually, people collected uh, the frequencies of selected words. They actually removed stop words, removed pronouns, and some frequent word, uh, words such as Jesus, and looked. Uh, at their data in order to see whether uh, we can call uh, portraits of four uh, Gospels. Well, you can uh, read um, the uh, data set now. And first we, uh, thing we have to do now is actually to uh, assign their own names. Uh, it is needed as we want to plot uh, the names for each uh, word on our plot. So now it's time for you to uh, do these exercise on your own. And if people are ready with their code, you can show it. Just please share your screens to show me both uh, this. Of your PCA and localization.
Guys, are you there? Yeah, we're there. Yeah. Yes. So, how are your code? Codes. Is there anybody ready to show uh, your data? I mean, uh, your um, summary, the summary of uh, your PCI model.
Okay, guys, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so my question was, uh, well, what can we say about the word father? It is in this uh, bottom left corner of our plot. Uh, what can we say about it? Is, is it a, a marker for some uh, Bible? It is uh, more often used in John's Gospel, yes? Yeah, yeah. So it's more characteristic for, uh, uh, for John's Gospel rather than for Luke and Matthews and Mark's, yeah? So the um, uh, general conclusion is that actually John's gospel is distinct from, um, uh, is distinct, yeah? And uh, well, um, I can uh, also um, mm, uh, repeat that uh, actually uh, we can see some noisy uh, black uh, cloud here, yeah? And could you um, answer, how can we interpret this kind of uh, blob uh, here uh, near the OO point? So these are words that are used in uh, all of these four gospels uh, in some equal points. Yeah, right. So actually they uh, don't differ that much uh, in all four um, uh, text, yeah. Well, and uh, what can you, um, uh, what, uh, what uh, uh, can we do now? We can just um, uh, use the predict um, function uh, to predict the coordinates for the word Jesus. Uh, as you probably remember, we uh, excluded this word uh, from the um, uh, from the study before, and uh, our uh, PCA space uh, was uh, constructed without it. But now, uh, since we know its uh, frequencies in all four texts, we can uh, add it to our plot. So this is uh, a supplementary point, uh, point technique. Uh, we, we will use uh, uh, the next lab as well for um, categorical data. So sometimes uh, some very frequent words can distort our space. So first we remove it, construct the space, and then add it as a supplementary point. Yeah. So now we can see that uh, we can predict this uh, word Jesus. To, ha to have the coordinates, uh, coordinates such as uh, minus 22, uh, minus nine, and so, so forth, yeah? And see what happens with this word. Uh, but actually, you see that uh, on our PC1 axis, uh, the uh, X limit is actually from minus 03 to 0.0. .0. So it's uh, it uh, well will be drawn um, well much uh, more uh, and more and more to the uh, left and um, uh, to the bottom of uh, this uh, this uh, our previous plot. Yeah. Okay, and now I can ask you. to uh, plot the, uh, sometimes it is, uh, well, actually um, very interesting to look at, not just on the first and the second component, but also to the third component. Yeah, because you can see that, well, some variance uh, is not explained. Yeah, and we can see uh, other kind of distances. Yeah, uh, if we um, well, uh, 
make a by plot for PC2 and PC2, uh, use this auto plot function. Oops. Yeah, but uh, actually put uh, X equals two and Y equals three uh, after the PCA here. So you can do it like this. Yeah, just add x equals 2 and y equals 3. And look at the output. Um, well, my question now is how do you interpret this kind of plot? We are trying to differ uh, the gospels uh, by the different angles of uh, the right. coordinates and uh, mm -hmm. the words are uh, used here in the same way as in the uh, plot before the closer they are to the uh, to those coordinates, uh, the more often they are used in those gospels. Yes. Yeah. Now uh, I'm agree with you, uh, and you can see that John's um, gospel st still uh, differs from three others. Uh, but now we can more clearly see the difference between Mark and Matthew and Luke data. Yeah, and we can see you lexical markers for these uh, gospels. Yeah, such as uh, straightway for Mark and pass for Luke and kingdom for Matthew. Yeah. So now we uh, kind of uh, have more information uh, about um, uh, our data. But uh, please be careful as this plot explains how much of variance could you tell me? Please sum up uh, 11.9 and uh, 6.5. You see, we all only see kind of uh, 17 to 18% of variance explained. Yeah. So, um, 
this is just a hint to look at the explained variance first and then just interpret your data. Okay, so I see that we have um, about, uh, well, 20 more minutes. So now I would like to um, go back uh, to, if you are okay with this uh, part of our lab. Yeah, if, if you don't have any further questions, no questions? Well, I think no questions. So I, I just wanted to uh, go back to the previous lab as we have a lot of um, stuff that we didn't uh, discuss last time. So please open. Um, um, this slide from the class from March 21, right? Uh, at which point shall we open it? Yeah, I'll show you now. Yeah, the idea, my idea was just to talk um, about the last part of uh, the lab. Yeah, uh, just to skip uh, all the models we discussed before. Uh, and let us start um, with um, discussing uh, the variable importance and uh, other, well, metrics of model ac accuracy. Uh, let us just, uh, mm, let me just remind you uh, the data we discussed because it was, well, many years before, uh, probably, uh, no, it was just uh, already with uh, this uh, social distancing time, but still it was well, uh, uh, yeah, uh, in the uh, middle of March. Yeah. So we have data on uh, some uh, constructions, on the use of certain constructions, and we had uh, a number of predictors to. Um, uh, actually, to, um, uh, um, to which uh, could uh, well probably predict the choice between two types of construction. Yeah, and in uh, Lefshina's data, we actually used uh, well uh, such uh, predictors as some linguistic uh, um, linguistic features from the context, such as. Uh, um, transitive verbs or verbs of causation or uh, other kind of semantics and syntax. 
but also a kind of social linguistic variable, such as, for example, country. Yeah. And well, I just in order to remind you, I will now show you the um, one of the model when we just um, use um, uh, this kind of GLM function in order to uh, run the to fit to fit the model. Yeah. And well, we just um, briefly discussed that there is a stepwise selection techniques just to see what happens. But now I just go to the uh, idea of how we, um, uh, how can we uh, measure the variable importance. Yeah. So the technique of variable importance is actually considered to be uh, model independent. So we actually take different kinds of um, uh, statistical modeling, but uh, then we can use the package caret just to um, uh, to uh, run the var in function. So what this particular uh, function does, uh, it actually looks uh, at each predictor that participates in the model, yeah? And uh, look to what extent it is efficient uh, independently from other variables. If we, um, if we uh, show not all the data set for the, uh, for the uh, model, but just some uh, samples of them, yeah? And uh, from this var in function, we can see to what uh, extent um, our, um, our um, uh, uh, predictors are kind of stable to predict the results. Well, uh, varying actually uh, as, uh, gives as an output, uh, well, some, uh, uh, some numbers that are not normalized, but you can also uh, run the uh, argument to normalize them from uh, 0 to 1. But now you can see in 212, uh, uh, tell, we, we, you can see that uh, this uh, var imp uh, result is not normalized. Yeah. So um, we will uh, well use this var imp um, function later when we also um, run uh, uh, very well models such as um, uh, random forest and other things. So you can use it with any kind of uh, model you, uh, you want. Well, uh, and uh, let us talk a bit about model ac accuracy. Yeah, uh, actually it is not uh, well in new stuff for you because you uh, already know that we usually have to well divide our data sets into the training and test sets. Yeah, things like that. Uh, I just uh, wanted to show you how we can interpret the data using the test set, uh, how we can visualize it. Yeah. So uh, let us look at this uh, part of the code. Yeah, uh, here I just, well, use some uh, mm, set seed uh, factor in order to, well, get a stable result. So I just fixed uh, my uh, randomizer. Uh, and then in order to reproduce the same results uh, as I run my uh, models that, and to reduce a kind of variability from the random points. Okay, so first I uh, actually um, um, use some uh, sampling to divide my data into the train and test uh, part. Yeah, so you can see it there. Uh, and uh, now 
I can actually, well, make two um, data. The first one is test and the second is train. And now let me uh, plot uh, my data using uh, red and black points in order to see the distribution of the um, train and test data. Yeah. Uh, but uh, now I uh, actually uh, just have an idea uh, what happens in the train set. Yeah. Uh, we. Uh, Oh, actually, it was just from another, from the previous data set. Sorry, I was not right uh, here, but any, any, anyhow, we still have a choice of construction and some other predictors, yeah? Yeah, and we can see that the um, distribution of the goal constructions and theme constructions, also two kinds of construction, uh, is kind of different in the train set, yeah? Uh, and now we can see what happens in the test set. Yeah, so I do just the same code, but with the load test data. And just see what happens here, just to get an idea on the, just uh, the number of, uh, constructions in each class of my uh, predictors. Yeah. Uh, and then I can just um, do produce uh, the predicted data matrix. Yeah. So I just uh, use the, um, uh, use my model and make confusion matrix. So uh, in this um, load test P data uh, table, uh, you can see uh, what my model predicts, yeah, for the test data. And prediction is just the one of the um, uh, one of the variables in my uh, 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 in my model. Uh, and I just briefly show you some uh, information in, about my confusion matrix and general statistics. So now I will use 0.5 in order to, well, make a decision about what happens uh, with my construction. And if uh, the prediction is less than 0.5, then I will think that it, this construction should be assigned to the theme class and it, if it is less than uh, 0.5, then it will be assigned to the goal class. Yeah. So we can use the confusion matrix in order to see what uh, happens with our um, statistics. Yeah. And now we can see the accuracy. Yeah. We can see that there are actually 12 uh, uh, observation points that was misclassified. Yeah, they were uh, predicted as theme, but actually a goal. And we can see that there are eight points that were uh, predicted as goal, but actually they are uh, theme. And from this confusion matrix, we can also take, uh, well, a lot of uh, statistics about sensitivity, specificity, and other kinds of uh, data using this confusion matrix. And uh, sometimes uh, it is, uh, well, useful to just look at particular point and see what happens. 
And since we use some corpus data here, we can actually refer to some particular examples and look at them and see and probably, well, um, uh, th uh, think uh, more on what happens with these particular examples. Yeah. So here I just uh, show the uh, 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 the set of uh, predictors. Yeah. Uh, the dependent variable such as construction. Yeah. And I see the response and I see what, what is predicted. Yeah. So we look at uh, misclassified examples and uh, see what, what happens here. Well, and we can also look at uh, some nice plots such as this, this yeah in order to see how our observed and predicted values are distributed. So actually here I use the same sigmoid as we used um, just in order to visualize the sigma as a function to fit the binary logistic regression model. Yeah, here you can see that uh, the, the threshold uh, is set to 0.5, yeah, and actually you can see, well, some misclassified um, examples. And there is one more um, useful technique to visualize your data. Uh, in order to see what happens with the data uh, distribution. Actually, we can plot uh, the response variable from our binary logistic regression model on the y-axis. Yeah. So you see the probabilities here from zero to one. Yeah, and we can see the uh, our data points. So I use some jittering. Actually, we have only two uh, classes of data on the x-axis, goal and theme. Yeah, but using these violin plots, we can see that the most of our data are actually uh, predicted uh, with the uh, probability clear to oh, mm, uh, close to zero for the goal construction and close to one to the theme construction. And sometimes if you see some, well, um, some data here, uh, for example, some classes that are not, not like this, this is kind of a normal uh, pattern for this uh, model, but sometimes you can see some, well, strange um, mm, clusters, yeah, which are mi misclassified. And this is the uh, good point to start to look at the data, at particular data points, and just to think that that can be probably other variables that would be uh, interesting for your study. Okay, and that's all that I wanted to show you for today. Uh, do you have any Thank you. questions? Yeah. Uh, Still, can we uh, go back to the code and uh, the center variable? What does it actually mean? What, do you uh, mean? Uh, we, what kind of uh, center? Sorry. Um, uh, uh, just at the, in the very beginning of our uh, class, uh, class we um, described. Ah, you you uh, you asked me to go to the PCA uh, class. Right? Ah, okay, okay. Let me go back to this. 
uh, yeah, just copy this one. Let me look at the uh, the stuff here. Center, center, center before. Sorry, I just uh, get confused. Sorry, sorry, just uh huh. It was just above here, as far as I remember. Above? Yeah, I think. Uh, center? No. It was in a separate I just, cell. Sorry, I just. Uh, it was in a separate cell. Ah, okay, I see. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, let me just, uh, yeah. Screen for now, just sorry, this one, yeah. It's just here. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was already here. Uh -huh. uh, so here you can see that um, um, this, uh, yeah, um, uh, here you can see that um, if we um, kind of um, use the center uh, argument uh, uh, here, yeah. Uh, oh, well, mm, that's, um, I just think how to, uh, how to, uh, to how to explain it. Um, um, well, is it a part of a data set or is it a kind of a function? No, it's, it's a part of the PCA model. And so not about the data set uh, as is. Yeah. So you see that it is. Um, uh, uh, you see that it is the. Um, uh, it is the um, actually the um, uh, output of the um, peer comp. Um, uh, peer comp um, uh, function. Yeah. It looks like uh, it's supposed to be kind of a metric or something like this that comes out of PR comp, but what exactly it means? Uh, well, uh, it is uh, it uh, deals with um, uh, uh, that we uh, our variance is by definition is the deviation from the mean, right? Yes, it uh, is. and the idea of centering uh, the data uh, uh, is to well to center the um, uh, uh, the um, uh, to center the uh, our covariance. Yeah, uh, the idea that um, um, uh, is uh, we need a centering uh, sometimes. Uh, in order to well um, uh, well uh, it's not exactly the normalizing your data yeah that this is idea that what will be used as the mean uh, for our data if we center it then our uh, uh, decomposition matrix will be uh, a bit different Yeah, 
so, so w when we use this method, is it a method, right? Or, or what? Yeah, yeah, it is just uh, the uh, parameters of our uh, PCA uh, model. So we just train our PC model and then we apply this mm -hmm. method to this model and it does something with the results of the mm -hmm. trained model. Yeah, when we actually, when we uh, use the plotting of our data, we can choose between non-centered PCA and two centered PCA. So this is just a parameter to, to use. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, well, um, I will probably give you uh, a nice explanation, sorry, because it is a bit of uh, maths here. Yeah, um, probably I will just, uh, well, uh, publish it on our page. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot. Any other questions? So thank you a lot for today's class. Yeah. Oh, one more question. Ah, thank you. Okay, thanks. So, bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye.